Welcome to our lecture online. In this video, we're going to try to give you that intuitive feeling of what we mean by the critical region. Remember, the critical region was a small region to the left or to the right or on both sides of a distribution of a population such that if the test statistic falls within that critical region, you would reject the null hypothesis. But what does that even mean? So let's try to make some sense out of it. So let's use an example to get that intuitive feeling. Let's say that we manufactured screws and those manufactured screws should have a shear strength of more than 120 pounds with a standard deviation of 12 pounds. Hmm. So how are we going to verify that our manufactured screws actually do meet that criteria? So what we're going to do is we're going to do a test and we're going to start off with setting a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is defined that the screws that we manufacture have a shear strength of 120 pounds. And what that means is when we set up a, um, a null hypothesis, that when we say that it's equal to 120 pounds, in this case, we mean that it's 120 pounds or less. That's all wrapped into that one statement. So we give it the upper limit of the region where we don't want our screw strength to be, the shear strength of our screws. We want it to be greater than 120 pounds. So we set our null hypothesis equal to 120 pounds. Certainly if it's less than that, that's also a bad thing. So that's included with that null hypothesis. It's understood, even though we don't explicitly write it like this, we write it like that. All right, so Notice that our sample size that we're going to be using is equal to 36 in this case as well, so that's a given. So, first of all, we're going to say that if the null hypothesis is true, then if we take a sample, we expect the mean of the sample to be the same as the mean of the population if the null hypothesis is true. If the null hypothesis is true, then the mean would be 120 pounds. Therefore, our sample size, or the sample that we take, would have a mean of 120 pounds. And we then have to calculate what we call the standard error. It's kind of like the standard deviation of the sample. And we use the letter S for that, and it's equal to the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. So again, sample size does make a difference, and we'll show you how that affects if we take different sample sizes later on in a later video. So we take the standard deviation that was given. Now, in the future also, we're going to deal with cases where we don't know the standard deviation of the, of the population. But let's say that it's known 12 we divide it by the square root of the sample size, 36, that's 12 divided by 6, or 2. So that's the standard error. What that means is that the, that the distribution of all the samples, let's say we take a number of samples of 36 screws. Well, what that means is that we'll have different means of those samples. There'll be a, a, a range or a variety of means of the samples. And if we then look at plus or minus 2 sigma, away from the mean. Of course, here the sigma essentially is what we call the standard, the standard error. So maybe I should have put an S there instead of sigma, but essentially it's the standard error of the sample distributions. And notice that if the mean of all the samples would be 120, 95% because plus or minus two sigma essentially is 95% of all the means of all the samples that we take would fall between 116 and 124. Again, that's assuming that the null hypothesis is true, which means 95% of all the samples will fall between plus or minus two sigma away from the mean when we talk about the mean of the samples. All right. So what that means is we can expect 5% of all the samples that we take to fall outside the mean. Now, notice that if it could be on both sides, that means 2.5% on the left, 2.5% on the right. So, hmm, but that's not really what we're interested in. We're interested in only the values that are greater, right? Because we want to meet a standard with the shear strength of the screws. So let's say that we want 5% of all the samples to have a shear strength greater than 120 pounds. So we want to be able to reject the null hypothesis. So we come up with what we call the critical region that's associated with the value of 5% of the total distribution of all the samples. 
we want 5% to be, we want to find, oh, let me put it like this. So what we want to do here is, we want to grab a sample, and we expect the mean of the sample to fall in the critical region. If the mean of the sample falls in the critical region, there's 95% chance that we can reject the null hypothesis and be correct. And there's only a 5% chance, that's the level of significance, that we reject the null hypothesis, but actually we shouldn't have rejected it because the null hypothesis is still true. So, in other words, if we take a sample of 36 screws, we look at the test statistic, if the test statistic falls in the critical region, we're going to reject the null hypothesis and we have 95% probability that that was the correct decision. In other words, we have a 95% probability of believing that the strength of the, sh of the screws, the shear strength, is sufficient and we can reject the null hypothesis, meaning the shear strength is greater than 120 pounds. All right, so what do we do? Well, we perform a what we call a one-tail test. We don't want to look at both sides. We want to put all 5% on one side because we want to have a 95% probability that we can reject the null hypothesis. And the, sh the, sh the shear strength of the screws are greater than 120 pounds. So we test the sample of a 36 screws. We pick out 36 randomly selected screws. We test their shear strength. And let's say, for example, that in this case, of the one sample of 36 screws, the average shear strength is 124 pounds. What does that tell us about the entire population? Does that tell us that on average the entire population has a shear strength greater than 120 pounds? Hmm, how do we test that? Well, we're going to check the test statistic. So let's calculate the test statistic. And if it's greater than the Z score of the edge of that critical region, notice for 5% the Z score is 1.65. How do I know that? Well, I go to my trusted table that I keep handy right here. I look at my table and I look for 5%, which is right about there, and I say it's 1.65. So 1.65 Z score corresponds to 5% of all the values of the distribution. So that's where that came from. All right, check the test statistic. We say that the test statistic T is equal to the mean of the sample that we just took minus the mean of the population if the null hypothesis is true, which means that the mean would be 120 pounds. And we divide that by the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. So in this case, that would be, we had a mean in our sample of 124 minus the mean of the population, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, divided by the standard deviation, which is 12, divided by the square root of 36. So that would be equal to 4 divided by 12 divided by 6, like this. And so that's 4 divided by 2, which is 2. So we have a test statistic equal to 2, and then we're going to compare that to the z-score of the edge of our critical region. And so here we go. We can see clearly that t is greater than z. 2 is greater than 1.65. And if that's the case, what do we do? We reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis was that the screws have a shear strength of 120 pounds which includes all values less than 120 pounds. So with the one sample where we took 36 screws and we tested those 36 screws and the mean of the shear strength ended up being 124 pounds for those 36, that was sufficient for us to determine since T, the test statistic, falls inside the critical region that we have a 95% probability of saying that we are correct that the population has a shear strength, the, sc the screws, the population of screws have a shear strength greater than 120 pounds on average. And that is how we use the critical region to determine if we can reject a null hypothesis or if we can't reject it. So 95% probability that we're correct in rejecting the null hypothesis and claiming that the screws have sufficient shear strength by just testing 36 of them. And that is how it's done. They actually do that? They actually do that. Matter of fact, on our program, we, 
we're going to do testing and we're going to use this exact kind of uh, system to determine if our test results are good enough. Because we can't test it a million times, we can only test it so many times. So they say test it 14 times and based upon that sample, we should be, be able to, with a certain level of confidence, determine if, we're, if the test pass or not. So we're actually using that.